Welcome back to the beginner game programming tutorial. This is lesson four, and I am chilly. Now I've got a lot planned for this video, so let's get right to it. Uh, first thing, I want to make this text larger. I'm going to make it this big. I think that will uh, be better for you guys watching on YouTube and following along. Uh, if on the off chance you prefer the uh, lower level of magnification for some reason, just let me know in the comments and uh, we'll see. Maybe I'll put it back, but I think that this will be preferable. Now in the last video, uh, we learned we learned about variables. We learned how to make them and we learned how to use them. And we also learned uh, about the addition operator, which basically uh, takes a number on its left, takes a number on its right, goes nom 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 and poops out the sum of those two numbers. Very simple, very intuitive. Okay, the last thing was that uh, I, I showed you, well, how to use the addition operator and the variable to offset some base coordinate of our, uh, of a pixel in our image here, our sprite. So we used that to be able to move the x coordinate, to move our sprite to the left or right, and then I, uh, I gave you the mission to do the same for the y coordinate so that we can move it up and down. And this is the result of that uh, task. So you should have something similar to this. Let's just run it just to be sure. Here it is. Here's our crosshairs. And by just changing these two numbers, we'll go with uh, 400 here. I will go with 400 all around. So I'm changing our uh, dx and dy from negative 100 to negative 400. So it should move our cursor closer to the top left corner. And indeed it has. All right, mission accomplished. So that was uh, that was last lesson. Uh, one more thing I want to talk about before I get on to uh, get on to the topic of this tutorial is uh, in the last lesson uh, I started off by naming the variable x and halfway through I changed the name to dx. Now the reason for that is because dx stands for uh, delta x or displacement x. So it, when I changed that, I was no longer representing the actual x location of the graphic, but I was representing a displacement from some base position of the graphic. Uh, in this case, the base position is at 700, and then we take displacements from that position. But uh, a good question you might ask, is why choose 700? What reason is there? And the answer is is that there is no reason. It's completely arbitrary. I just happened to be at 700 because that's the position I was using uh, from the uh, last lesson. But in reality, there is no good reason to, uh, to base your graphic at some arbitrary location. So if you don't have a real good reason, and I can't think of one, to base your graphic at some specific location, you might as well just put it at zero. And that's what we're going to do. We are going to uh, we are going to locate our the base position of our graphic at zero zero, right? Now if we do this, dx and dy isn't so much a displacement as it is the actual x and y position of the center of our crosshairs. So we can change the name of our variables from dx, dy to just x and y. 
and of course we'll have to change all of our other uh, things here so in the case of this put pixel instead of being at uh, 695 it would be at negative mm -hmm. 5 with respect to the uh, the center of our graphic which is at 0 0 so this one would be at negative 5 and this one would just be at 0 so I'm going to uh, I'm going to modify all of these put pixel calls to make our graphic, our targeting reticle, uh, centered around the point zero zero or the origin. And when I'm finished that, we will be back. All right, I am back, and I've finished. Uh, revamping our uh, targeting reticle drawing code here uh, you may notice that uh, the formatting is a little different than what I've been doing before I, I've added some white space here so that uh, all my X's and Y's and everything line up prettily it makes it a little bit more readable and uh, you don't have to do it that way. It, it works perfectly fine the way I've been doing it up until now. Uh, you may wonder if it's alright to do it like this, and the answer is it's perfectly fine. You can format uh, your lines of code, you can add white space wherever you want. Because uh, C++, it doesn't care at all about uh, white space formatting, so... I just want to talk about that for a while. It doesn't matter how you, uh, how much or how many, how little space you put between uh, your, your, uh, what do you call it? variable names or delimiters or literals or whatever these things are. So you could put absolutely no space between any of this and build, and we see success. So no problems. You could also do something like this. You could put a bunch of space here. You could put stuff on different lines and like just totally fuck it up. This is the fugliest line. This is the fugliest statement I've ever seen. And as far as the compiler is concerned, that is a perfectly uh, acceptable statement as long as everything's there and it's in the right order and you finish her up with a, a semicolon it's all good now although the uh, compiler might not have a problem with that it's not exactly the prettiest code in the world to read or understand for a human so that's why we generally follow uh, certain code formatting Mm, conventions, styles, it just makes it a hell of a lot easier to read the code. I'm g I've gone a little overboard with this, you don't have to go this far, this is just like, this is kind of bordering on OCD, but yeah, it's a good idea to format things fairly consistently. I mean, the other thing you could do is you could, you could put all of your code on a single line. You could do it like this, where everything's like just lined up on one big long line look at that look at that line of code and if I build it no problem that's beautiful but again very hard to read so the moral of this story is C++ does not give a rat's ass about white space uh, here's a little uh, SAT analogy question for you. White space is to C++ as Ron Paul is to what? Just a little, a little something for you to ponder. Now, uh, so this is our uh, targeting reticle centered around zero zero 
and I've set my X and my Y to 400 and 300. So that should place the center of my targeting reticle at the center of my window. Ah, I pushed the wrong button. Uh, it didn't do that. Wait a minute. Okay, I think I fucked something up here. Let's see. Oh, what happened here? That's odd. Uh. Okay, that's not what I wanted. Let's try that again, folks. That's more like it. Okay, I don't know what happened there. It was weird. Uh, mommy, I'm scared. Okay, so we got the targeting reticle, and it's at the center of the screen, and that is good. Now, now we can finally get on to what I wanted to talk about. So, I'm going to get you guys again just to, uh, to type uh, what I type in. I'm going to type if kbd, this is an object, uh, and we'll go with uh, down, now nah, we'll go with right is pressed. And we'll say x is equal to what? 500. All right, and that is it. Just three uh, or five lines of code, however, four lines. I can't count with shit. <laughs> however many lines of code this is, that's all you have to type in. And build it. There we go. All right. Now, I'm not going to run this yet, and I don't want you to run it yet, because I want you to make a prediction, just based on what you know about C++ up to this point, and what you know about the English language, and computers in general. I want you to guess what this code will do, how this will affect the program. So think about it for a minute or two, give it your, your best educated guess, and when you're done that, click start debugging and here's our window so we've got our targeting reticle and it's in the center of the screen as usual uh... nothing much seems to have changed unless you happen to press the right arrow key on your keyboard in which case it will jump the reticle to the right in fact it will jump it to the right about a hundred pixels And uh, I hope that's not too surprising, given uh, the code that we have here. I mean, just reading the code, you can read it if right is pressed on the keyboard, x equals 500. Or in other words, if the right key, if the right arrow key on the keyboard is pressed, set x to 500, which will, of course, move it right from its earlier position of 400. And that is exactly what's going on here. Uh, so this is a, uh, a new statement. It's called a conditional or a branching statement. And it follows the uh, basic uh, format of if and then some expression if some expression some code so how this works is after the if you will always have these brackets and in the brackets you have an expression now the expression can evaluate ultimately to two different uh, values true or false if the expression evaluates to true the code within these braces is executed it can be one line of code or it can be a hundred lines of code it doesn't matter but everything within 
these braces will be executed if the expression is true. If it is false, the code here is skipped and execution continues as if nothing ever happened. Now, uh, what do I want to say here? That's about it, I guess. So what constitutes true or false? Well, we're not going to go into uh, that right now, but true and false are uh, the values that can be assumed by a Boolean variable or a bool. A Boolean variable is uh, it's a variable and it can be either true or false. I'm repeating myself now. Now looking at our, uh, our if uh, conditional here, we see that we are calling a function. We can tell that because we have a name and then we have some brackets afterwards. So this is a, uh, it's a function call. And uh, if we mouse over it, we see on our tooltip that the function call returns a value. This uh, thing right here at the very beginning of the tooltip that says bool, that is the type of the return value. So we can tell from this tooltip that our function, right is pressed, returns a Boolean value, which means it returns a value that can be either true or false. It only has two possible uh, return values, true or false. And from the wording of the function, we can assume that if it returns true, that means that the right button is being pressed. And if it returns false, the right button is not being pressed. So, uh, yeah. What happens is when the computer gets to this statement, it calls the, uh, the function right is pressed, and that function says either, yeah, the right button is being pressed, or nah, it's not being pressed. And if it is being pressed, that says, oh, okay, and then it goes in here and sets x to 500. Whereas if the right button at this point is not being pressed, it, this function will return false, and the if statement will be, oh, okay, and then it'll skip this. And that is basically that. It's, it's not a very complicated uh, concept here. Uh, we've also introduced a new object, just as we use our graphics object to put pixels on the screen. We have a keyboard object, which we use to, uh, to check the status of our keyboard. So this represents our computer's keyboard. And we can call a function, and that function will tell us whether uh, a specific key on the keyboard is being pressed. Now you can notice that uh, these two functions are rather different from each other. In the case of our put pixel function, uh, we pass it a bunch of values, and it changes some state of the computer. Uh, in this case, it changes the, uh, the display contents of our, s of our window. And it doesn't output a value. If we hover over it, we see its return value is void, which means nothing. It doesn't return any kind of variable. So we give it, we feed it some numbers, and it changes the state of the computer in order to output some information to the user. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, write is pressed function, we don't give it any information. It has zero parameters. It takes zero parameters. But what it does is it outputs a value based on the state of the computer. So it reads the state of the computer, well, the state of the keyboard, and it outputs for us a boolean value based on the state of whatever key is associated with the function call. So these, uh, these are two functions, but they're different kinds of functions, and they're kind of complementary to each other. This is, a, this is a strictly output function, and this is a strictly input function.
We'll talk more about different types of functions later on. Now I anticipate that some of you might be uh, a little mystified by how this program works. Uh, up until now, our program has just drawn something on the screen, and that's it. It just draws something on the screen, just like crosshairs or a single dot, and that's it. So you could imagine that our program starts, does some initialization, then it comes to our compose frame uh, function, draws its crosshairs, and then just sits around. And if you believe that that is the case, then the behavior we're seeing here would not make any sense. Because what would happen is our program would come here, it would check if the right button is pressed, and if it's pressed, it would set x to 500. If it's not pressed, it would leave it at 400. Then it would draw our uh, crosshairs, and then it would then that that would be the end of it. And no matter if you press the button later on, it wouldn't matter because our crosshairs are already drawn. It's finished. It doesn't matter what button you press after that point. But the actuality is is that this function is not just being uh, called once. We're not just drawing the crosshairs once and then we're finished. We wash our hands, we're done, I'm going home. That's not how it happens. Actually, uh, we are redrawing the crosshairs many times a second. We're redrawing, uh, we're recomposing our frame over and over and over and over again. Many tens of times a second. Uh, and to prove that, I will run for you a little program here called Fraps. Fraps is a uh, application used for screen capturing and for benchmarking. And it will display an overlay on a DirectX window. And the overlay will show the frames per second. All right. So here we go, and I hope you can see this uh, this pretty yellow 60 in the, the top left-hand corner of our window. That means that uh, our application is redrawing the window 60 times a second, unbeknownst to the rest of us. And that is why, wait, let me give this window the focus, that is why when you press the arrow key, our uh, our cursor seems to jump to the right here because it's constantly being with redrawn so when you're not pressing the arrow key it's constantly drawn in the middle and when you press the right key the next time it's redrawn it will be redrawn in a hundred pixels to the right all right and that is that's basically how games work they they just constantly redraw the screen as fast as possible or as fast as is advantageous which is different than other applications such as this text editor which will only redraw the screen if it thinks that uh, something has changed and it needs to redraw it and then it will only redraw the portion that uh, it believes has changed so that's a little different between games and other applications on the computer. Uh, one last thing. I'm going to get Fraps up here again. Because I like it so much. Where's my pretty number? There it is. Okay. Yeah. So up here I have uh, 60, 60 frames per second. But if you tried to run Fraps on your computer with this application, you might get a different number. Uh, you might get 100 frames a second, or you might get 120 or 75. And that would just depend on the re refresh rate of your monitor. Your monitor has something called a refresh rate, and that is the rate at which it updates its display contents which is independent of the rate at which uh, the application redraws to its window. So the way I have the program set up here 
it will not try to draw faster than the refresh rate because that would be that would be futile I mean what would be the benefit of you know drawing 120 frames if only half of them would actually be seen by the user so the frame rate is capped at the refresh rate of the monitor you can you can uncap it but there's really no point in doing that uh, okay so I've babbled on a lot about various stuff but the important thing is that now we can control the flow of our program we can conditionally execute uh, statements which in conjunction with some kind of input function such as this uh, function here will allow us to start creating interactive programs and that's the next step on the way to making a game type thing so it's that time again. It's time for your homework assignment. Uh, I think you could probably uh, guess what's coming up here, but so far we've implemented uh, moving the pixel to the right when we press the right key. But if you uh, type keyboard, KBD, and then dot, you will see that we have a, a whole slew of functions here for inputting. We have down is pressed, left is pressed, up is pressed. We also have space and enter. So, uh, what I'm going to get you guys to do is to implement uh, the other direction keys so that when we press up, the uh, crosshairs will move up by 100 pixels, and likewise for left and down. That shouldn't be too difficult. But I also am going to give you a uh, one more task, and that is that when the space bar is pressed, I want the crosshairs to change to red. So not only will we will we be able to move our crosshairs, but we will also be able to change their color. Oh, the power! It's intoxicating. Yeah. Uh, so that is your task, and just uh, for shits and giggles, I will show you here what the application should look like when you have completed it correctly. You should be able to have something like this, where you can control the position of your cursor through any of nine possible positions, and if you press the spacebar, if I can find my spacebar, I think it's here. The cursor will turn red. Oh! Isn't it beautiful? If you try hard enough, I think, let me just see if I can do it here, I think you could trace out, yeah? You could trace out a beautiful, beautiful, Swastika. <laughs>